So thank you very much for inviting me. I love to be in Berlin. Um, your newspaper is a very important one, I think, and I'm always happy to uh, support it in one way or another. Um, and I'm also happy for the opportunity to think about a topic about which, in fact, I have not really thought and more have research, as uh, um, it was said just uh, previously, research emotions in the private sphere, trying to show really how the private sphere is structured by um, public processes, I, I would say, or at least institutional processes. And so this is, for me, almost the first time that I have to think about um, the presence of, pol of emotions in, uh, in politics. Let me start then. Modern politics displays a paradox, or modern liberal politics displays a paradox. It is fundamentally based on the assumption of rationality, that is, on the assumption that citizens must choose leaders rationally, and on the assumption that the public sphere is the site of deliberation and debate. And yet, modern politics, having become mediated by images, print media, storytelling, endless flow, of media stories and media uh, images. So modern politics is particularly prone to the display, the diffusion, and the manipulation of emotions. Of course, there is a way in which we could say that this is not new and that the ancients, Plato and Aristotle even um, more um, obviously, long understood the relationship between uh, emotions and political discourse between narrative and rhetoric. But I would say that they probably cannot provide us as guides to ana analyze what is happening today in modern polities because I think they had a qualitatively different understanding of the role of, of emotions since it concerned mostly the effect which uh, leaders and charismatic leadership in particular had on the emotions of their listener. Um, their view of emotions was that it constituted a kind of manipulation, of effective manipulation of the speech of the orator, of the leader. Whereas I think that emotions, as I'm going now to explain in fact, I think that mo emotions in contemporary politics should be understood in structural terms and we should really invent, this is what social sciences do, they try to map out the reality of what we do with new concepts uh, that we do not necessarily have in everyday and ordinary language. So what I'm saying is that, I'm, I am not saying that emotions are irrelevant to uh, modern politics, but I'm saying that the politics, that the emotions of the politics of liberal polities demand maybe a qualitatively different analysis of the process involved than the one usually uh, used in the analysis of rhetoric. So just to give a very trivial example, the use of images of modern politics surely changes something to the formation of political opinions and attitudes, and most crucially to the process by which emotions are diffused. Not only how I acquire emotions, but also to the process of contagion of emotions inside the social body. Um, so I'm going to submit the following proposition, and it is that um, emotions not only in her in here in the political process in the modern political process but also that they are not necessarily unwelcome or inimical to the political process or rather if they are i think we should need in new terms how they are and when they are unwelcome so emotions in here in the political process and are even sometimes, and we need to start with that proposition, they're sometimes even beneficial to it. 
what do I mean? Um, let me take a very famous research by the neuropsychologist Antonio Damasio, who has showed that deliberative rationality, that is the very kind of rationality that is involved in decision making, must be, in order to be functional and to be really rational, must be informed by emotions because only through emotions can you form an attitude, an emotional attitude towards objects. That is, only through emotions can you hierarchize your preferences and figure out what is most urgent, what is most important to you. And it would seem that this would be crucial for the process, for example, of voting or forming a political emotion. Uh, for, for political attitude, sorry. So we cannot imagine, I mean, if, you, if the voters were entirely rational, what, the, what they would do following Antonio Damasio's study is that they would list attributes of each one of their candidates and then they would try to figure out, according to the list of uh, attributes, they would try to decide who to vote for. That is not how people vote. They vote with a kind of, I would say, rough emotional complex that orients their political attitude. And that is good too, that's my point. That is good too because without it we could not form what we call rationality. Uh, that's, that's something that uh, people who, do, um, uh, who study voting should uh, really take into consideration this research in um, the neurophysiology of emotions and the neurophysiology of rationality. Let me give you another example also of what I mean here. George Marcus has showed that moderate levels of anxiety facilitate the search for and processing of political information among voters. Events that generate anxiety, for example, will make people normally, who are normally indifferent to the news look for information. And for people who normally consume the news, it will make them read more than one newspaper, read several newspapers, and therefore have a kind of more sophisticated um, level of information. So anxiety is entirely conducive, if you want here, to the process of the formation of opinion and even to a better or more sophisticated, more complete process of formation of opinion. So this, again, simply suggests that the traditional view that we should separate emotion and rational opinion making is simply not true, in my opinion. Um, they do go in hand quite well. And I would say also the same is true about, for example, anger that is expressed in the sentiment of injustice. We would view anger that denounces injustice and that expresses itself as moral indignation, in fact, as entirely um, congruent with a good political order. Therefore, if we have established that emotions are not necessarily negative, that in fact they can even be more, they can be even positive and crucial to the political process, we can, I, I'm going to ask, this is going to be the main purpose of this very short presentation, uh, I'm going to ask then, when are emotions negative in politics? When are they unwelcome? Now, I don't have an extensive response. As I said, I'm not, I do not research this topic at all. Um, and I cannot review all the cases uh, in which an emotion is, or emotions are unwelcome, but I'm going to offer uh, um, I'm going to offer one proposition, and I think it, one proposition is enough in one paper just to think about. But before I answer my question, I want to dispel another commonly held view or opinion, since the question I, I'm asking is. When are emotions unwelcome in the political process? I think a fairly, I would say, well, I'm going to use the word, a fairly lazy way to answer that question 
would be to take the long list of negative emotions that we have, you know, envy, contempt, anger, hatred, etc., and say, oh, well, we don't want those in the political process. Um, again, I am skeptical of that strategy. Um, because um, the reason why we view some emotions as negative is often from two standpoints. One, it is from a moral standpoint, uh, from the standpoint of the moralist or the religious clergy, uh, a very long religious and moral tradition which has classified some emotions are mo as more uh, negative than others. And, the, uh, and I don't think that religion or morality are necessarily um, the area from which we should um, get our normative guidelines doesn't mean they cannot inform politics, but I don't think they should be the ex exclusive spheres of meaning providing our normative guidelines to think about politics. That's my first um, uh, th thing to say. And the second also, the second main claim is that what can feel negative from a subjective standpoint is not necessarily negative at all from a macro-social from a structural standpoint. And let me give you just a few examples of what I mean here, very quick examples of what I mean. In 17, the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes, in his book um, De Kiwe, uh, suggested, famously suggested, that fear is constitutive of the state of nature and that it is fear that will make people enter in a social contract and not the love of others and not, as we would say today, the desire to help each other. Not some altruistic motive, but some, in fact, entirely self-interested motive and the fear that someone is going to kill us. The fear of death is extremely powerful in Thomas Hodge's uh, view of why and how uh, people should get together and form a covenant and a society. Um, so here, obviously, um, fear is able to be converted into something that has a, a political status, that has a good political status, which is the formation of the social contract. To take an even clearer and um, famous, again, another famous example, of what I mean here, um, in the 18th century, Bernard de Manville, in his famous fable of the bees, argued that greed and envy could generate positive social goods such as commerce and exchange. And that these negative emotions, which were certainly condemned by the Christian church, greed and envy, were converted, in fact, into socially useful um, emotions um, because they encouraged, if you want, economic activity. They encouraged consumption and then encouraged production and, and work. Or still, to use another very famous example for Germans, uh, in, as you remember, in the Weberian account of the development of capitalism, it is the anxiety that is generated by the Deus absconditus, the God that you do not see, the God that is hidden. So it is the anxiety that is generated by the Deus absconditus that uh, has not revealed to us whether we have been elected or not. That anxiety is uh, the motivation, it's the motivational structure that um, brought a big macro change in Europe, such as making labor into a worthy activity, into a more th morally worthy activity. You remember this is the question that Weber asks, how it is that an activity such as labor, which is viewed entirely as contemptible, becomes actually a morally worthy activity. And what does that is the anxiety that is produced by the Protestant theology of the Deus absconditus. So, <clears throat> So my point is clear here, and this is, is really, I, I would say, theoretically, this should be my main point. 
we should really make a distinction between individual and the structural analysis of emotions in politics. And, um, and, and without that, I think we will not be able to move very far. What do I mean then by structural? This is what I want to, <clears throat> uh, I, I want to describe briefly before I move to, the ans to answering the question I ask. So again, given that I'm not a specialist, I have uh, separated three possibilities of a structural analysis of emotions. There could be more, um, um, but I think these three seem to be quite important. So even if there are more, I'm happy to stay with them. One level of a structural analysis or st structural existence of emotions would be um, a level that I would call a, which would be the aggregation of many individual emotions, such as, for example, take the example of the collective anger, um, which ends in demonstrations, mass protests, social movements, social revolutions, etc. So these movements are often the result of an individual emotion, which um, it, you have many people having emotions, and I would say all kinds of emotions. Some, uh, it could be anger, but not only it could be disappointment, it could be um, uh, hatred, it could be many different people have different kinds of emotions which we could label broadly under a broad label of opposition to or dissatisfaction with or something like that. These emotions are in turn um, what sociologists say is that they are framed by elite groups, such as political leaders, head of social movements, journalists, elite groups, which then frame those emotions and transform them into a coherent social movement. So think, for example, of the French Revolution, of the role of the bourgeoisie and the intellectuals in framing, in providing what, a, what sociologists call a cultural framing for social discontent. The framing effect of elites, of newspapers, of intellectuals enable us to speak about structural emotions that are located at the societal level and that are the aggregate effects of many individual wills and emotions, and that feed back into society. So that's the first level of a structural uh, existence of emotions in politics. The second level is located at what Raymond Williams, uh, the great um, literary theorist, British literary theorist, called structures of feeling which designate two opposite phenomena. Feelings points to first, when we say structure of feeling, it points to a kind of experience that is incohate, that defines who we are without being able to just say what is this who we are. And yet the notion of structure also suggests that this level of experience has an underlying pattern that is, is, is systematic rather than haphazard. So, so think, for example, of fear. I'm going to go, go back to this example. Think of fear as an underlying structure of feeling of liberal polities after 911 especially after the US. This is a kind of, I would say, free-floating climate, a general atmosphere, a feeling that exists in between media stories and in between our relationship to our political representatives. It is an affective register that is underlied and produced by media images, stories, international relations, policy, measure, policy measures by the state, etc. So I think here we can speak of emotional moods, climates, or affective registers, whatever terminology you want to use, which are created by um, media images, by media stories that are relayed by politicians and by policy making, which may or may not um, uh, be related to one single event, but we, which then settle, kind of settle in a society. 
they crystallize and they settle in the society. I think that 911 is a good example. We could speak also of the Cold War as being a very good example of that structure of feeling in which fear and the fear of communism and the fe fear of the Soviets was really structural to the American political um, uh, psyche. But we can speak also of a climate, certainly this is relevant in Europe, we can also speak of a climate of hope or despair. So I would say there are dominant affective registers in uh, uh, the political um, vo vocabulary of a country. So an affective register, I would say, is more diffuse and more enduring than very precise emotions that, that can be uh, short-lived. And I think that Dominique, Dominique Moisy, uh, who wrote a famous book on the geography of emotions, trying to characterize uh, the world with dominant emotions. So his thesis that American uh, culture and the culture of uh, the Middle East uh, differ profoundly because one is a culture of fear and the other one is a culture of humiliation. I think that what he's really telling us is that there are different affective registers in each one of these uh, societies. And the third structural level of um, emotions in politics is what I, I would say the um, emotions that are produced by the strongest actor in liberal polities, namely the state, which initiates actions and events that have an emotional meaning and emotional effects on the citizens. We can think, for example, of what I would call policies of hope, as when the American federal government gave hundreds of millions of dollars to save the mega um, insurance company AIG from uh, collapsing. That was not only an economic measure, but also an emotional measure. We can think also of the politics of memorialization, which is organized around such feelings as grief or guilt or forgiveness, politics of memory, which is initiated by the state. And such politics um, takes place as I would say, I would say what is the politics of memory? It is in fact a state emotional act. It is a state emotional ritual. It is a state emotional ceremony uh, in which what you display, if you want, is uh, grief, loss, guilt, forgiveness, etc. So um, all these are emotions that exist at the structural level. They are public, they are externalized, whether at the level of collective movements, whether in public spheres, whether at state policies. And I would say that in each one of these cases, the ways in which emotion makes meaning or produces meaning in the political sphere, in each case, it, it is different. In the first case of social movement or protest, for example, the social movement or what we call a protest vote, this is <clears throat> emotion as politics, the political act is the emotional act and the emotional act is the political act. In the second case of the public sphere, the affective registers that are produced by the kind of collaboration between policymaking and media images, I would say this is a representational way of making emotions present in the body politic. And the third case of the state, I would say this is a performative way of making or creating emotions. That performative means that when I say, when a state say, I officially apologize to the Armenian population, to the Jewish population, to the Palestinian population, the state is actually doing, creating an emotion simply by saying it. And this is possible because the state is the strongest actor. It has the possibility of doing these emotional performative acts. So let me summarize what I've said so far. I have said that an emotion that is negative for the individual from a moral or psychological standpoint is not necessarily so from a collective or social standpoint. And I've also said that political emotions should be thought of as structural phenomena, not as, and not as the rhetorical effect of politi politicians' discourse, which is how it has been thought uh, traditionally but rather as entities that inhere in the structure of liberal polities. To that extent, there is no way to long for a rational 
emotionless political sphere. I think well, this is something that derives quite clearly from what I say. It means that from a normative standpoint, we should not necessarily strive for a politics that has more reason in it. And here I think that the liberal, the traditional liberal theory of uh, the public sphere as a politics that is uh, governed by reason, Pace Habermas, I'm sorry, um, I think that theory is simply wrong. Or, you know, if it is right, I think it puts the philosopher, the political philosopher, in the absurd position of constantly bemoaning and whining the fact that the politics is too emotional. And I, know, I don't think this is a very productive fact. If emotions are intrinsically, as I said, a part of politics, then we should understand them as inhering in it, and we should try to, um, having this understanding, we should try to redirect emotions, these emotions, as emotions. Um, so this is why, I mean, Judith, I, I, I much more like the account of Judith Sklar, the philosopher Judith Sklar, who presented liberalism. She said liberalism is the political theory that abhors fear more than any other thing. And what she meant by that is that in the 17th century, when people uh, had been um, uh, persecuted, and when there had been wars of religion, there is this search, this collective search in Europe for a new political order in which people would not fear their, uh, the people who govern them. And liberal um, polity is really an answer to that. It is about creating a framework in which no one is afraid. In that sense, so Judith Clare, I think, put really an emotion, the lack of fear, into the heart of um, uh, liberalism. And I think this is more convincing. And Martin Nussbaum's recent book on political emotions is also important and follows, in fact, that strand because she also offers a model of the good polity as based on emotions and not on reason. She continues Sklar's intuition about the emotional condition of liberalism, namely saying that what is at the heart of liberalism is a certain emotional condition. But, I mean, I frankly uh, didn't find that Marta Nussbaum's response was very satisfactory. She thinks that we should put compassion and love at the center of liberal polities. And I don't know, I just didn't find it very interesting. I didn't find it, I don't find it personally extremely interesting, to tell you the truth. So uh, if that is the case, let me ask again how we are then to criticize normatively the use of emotions in politics. If emotions per se are not a problem, if negative emotions cannot always predict this, a negative societal outcome, then how shall we criticize emotions? I just have one suggestion. Not more, again, because this is not my topic. I'm going to say that when an emotion covers, hides uh, a self-interest, a, a, a collective self-interest, when it is used to cover a self-interest, and, and when that emotion blocks discussion and public debate and political participation, it is actually a very negative emotion. I tried to think of what, what, what kind of emotion would um, qualify, would, be, um, would respond to these criteria I just defined. And for me, the emotion that is most dangerous, I would say, to the political process today, certainly viewed from Israel, and I'll say a few words about it right now, um, is the emotion of fear. The emotion of fear. So I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude, uh, I have another five minutes as a conclusion, five, seven minutes to conclude by um, uh, reflecting, I would like to reflect on, on fear and its highly negative role, in my opinion, in politics. Thomas Hobbes, the author of The Leviathan, um, famously declared that when he was born, his mother gave birth to two twins, him and fear which may, you know, it's interesting because he then went on to become the philosopher of fear. And we may uh, wonder similarly if Netanyahu's regime was not also uh, born as a Hobbesian twin. 
as a kind of very particular view of uh, Jewish history um, and as a regime based on fear. That's why I would call Netanyahu really a regime where what, what, the, what characterizes that the regime is the constant invocation of fear. So we usually think, it's interesting, as Judith Sklar, like Judith Sklar, we usually think of fear as being the prerogative of you know, rogue regimes, pre-modern regimes, abusive regimes, terror regimes, um, anything that's not democratic and that uh, is um, bad elicits fear. And it elicits fear from the rulers to the governees. And, but I think that what we are witnessing is that fear is becoming more and more democratic. That is a dominant feeling in democracies as well. And it is an emotion that is manipulated by political elites in order, I would say simply, quite often it, quite in order to justify foreign policy. As a political emotion, fear is theatrical. In regimes of terror, this is obvious because there are show trials, we burn books in public, we set up public executions, and we spread terror to intimidate what we designate as our internal enemies. This is what characterizes a terror regime. It's the theatral theatralization of fear. In democracies which were based on the absence of fear, I think we're witnessing increasingly a new type of fear. Um, in which um, fear is present. It might be a bit less theatrical, although it is also sometimes theatrical, you know, see Daesh, you know, the uh, Islamic State. And it spreads, it spreads often in a less centralized way. It is, and it is provoked by often what we view as our outer enemies, not our inner enemies. And it is conveyed often more indirectly through the televised spectacle of the news. So during the Cold War, or when we look at images of terror attacks, 911, the Islamic State, all of that create disgust, panic, fear, and what they do is that they create also, they reinforce a kind of solidarity within democracies. Such fears can have a deep impact on the politics of uh, democracies. Uh, for example, a poll that was taken after 911 in the USA showed that a majority of those polled had become more conservative thus suggesting a direct link between fear and um, conservative political orientation. Another poll taken in 2004 in the USA showed a strong connection between thinking that civil liberties can be suspended for security purposes and watching a lot of TV news, going to church, and voting Republican. Conversely, those who thought that civil liberties should not be sacrificed for security also had a more diverse source of news than TV, were more likely to be secular and more likely to vote Democrat. In other words, peer, fear, sorry, I would say fear has become a part of a political ecology in which media, in which journalists who are hungry for um, um, uh, very graphic images with high emotional impact. We have here the journalists who are looking for something that uh, suits their professional ethos. We have political and economic elites invested in security. Um, uh, all of these reinforce mutually each other and create a conservative voter willing to suspend uh, civil liberties. So. We may wonder, and this is my conclusion now, we may wonder why is fear so powerful a political instrument? Of course, it gives in intense, uh, in immediate um, political benefits. Why? I want to ask why is fear so powerful, actually? Well, I'm going to offer three answers. Far fear, far more than anger, justifies the aggressiveness and violence that are at the heart of a certain view of international relations. In other words, today, um, I think that going to war 
out of uh, sheer anger or sheer, sheer self-interest is more problematic than if you did it out of fear because of the moral language in which uh, foreign policy is shrouded. That is, it is easier to justify uh, military aggressiveness or domination by invoking fear rather than by proudly claiming to be a bully. And I think this would be relevant to some of the decisions that the United States have made in the last decade, two decades or so. That's one. Fear is more compatible with our moral views uh, of international relations uh, than anger or self-interest. Two, fear overrides not only thinking, but most importantly, all other emotions. As evolutionary biologists suggest, fear is the emotion of pure survival. It helps us flee or fight. Fear invades the psyche and overrides all other emotional reactions. So if fear is well manipulated in the public sphere, it is the emotion that will win all other emotions, such as the desire to improve my life, the compassion for the distress of others, a sense of shame at my leader's uh, uh, embarrassing uh, or, uh, mistakes, etc. The desire for survival will always trump all other desires. This was exactly what Thomas Hobbes said. It will always trump all others. Fear then is, is likely to become dominant um, um, in order to uh, override other emotional claims of the kind I just mentioned, such as the desire for self for happiness or compassion for others. It is, um, um, it is the trump card of any political game. And finally, fear demands immediate action rather than a vision of the future or a long-term strategy. Fear is the emotion of the here and now. It is the emotion of not only those who lack a vision, but those who, by temperament, for example, Bush, want to go in now and do something about it. And um, um, that is required in fear. So Judith Sklar was right. A liberal polity abhors fear. She spoke about the fear that divided um, the leaders, the rulers, from the subjects. But we may wonder if we should not now, if we're not the witnesses of a fear she did not see, she passed away 20 uh, years ago, she did not see, which is the fear that creates solidarity vis-a-vis -vis enemies, some of which are real, some of which are, if not imagined, at least used too often, too easily to suspend human and civil rights. And uh, I think fear should be particularly feared because it creates either aggressiveness, fight, or apathy, flight, and is not compatible. I think it is the emotion that is truly not compatible with democratic policies. Um, therefore, we sh um, if we want to maintain liberal and democratic polities, what really we should fear is fear itself. Thank you. Was ich Sie gerne fragen würde, ist, ähm, äh, das, was Sie formulieren, äh, äh, wie kann man sowas sozusagen populär machen? Ist nicht das Problem der, äh, auch der, des politischen Alltags, der, der Politik, äh, dass genau so nicht gedacht wird? Dass ge so gedacht wird, äh, die Politik ist eine rationale Angelegenheit, äh, die Emotionen sollen draußen bleiben und dass es dann, gewissermaßen wie in der Dialektik der Aufklärung, sich Gefühle anstauen, weil sie draußen bleiben sollen und sich irgendwann aber Bahn brechen. Dass das aber der, das eigentliche Problem ist, also ähm, in europäischen Gesellschaften, wo man sehr viel zum Beispiel auch mit Ressentiment, mit den sogenannten, ähm, haben Sie sicher davon gehört, Wutbürgern zu tun hat, dass man diese angestauten Gefühle hat, die vielleicht gerade daher rühren, ähm, äh, dass äh, Emotion eben ausgeschlossen wird aus dem politischen Diskurs. Was würden Sie sagen? You're asking me 
um, how should we reintegrate emotions in politics? Um, well, I, 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 first of all, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think that what is important is to not assume, because as you said it very well, if we simply assume, um, if we simply assume that the sphere of politics is about rationality, then what we are doing, in fact, is um, we are doing a huge epistemological and tactical mistake. First, we do not know the object for what it is, namely the circulate. It's a sphere in which emotions circulate and shape the political process itself. Um, and then uh, what I think we do is then try to um, convince um, voters, no, and, and then, to, I mean, two things then. I think that the, um, if we deny the importance of emotions, those who will abide by that creed and refuse to understand the emotionality of the process will naturally give an advantage to those who have no shame, let's say, about invoking emotions, which is in a way what, I mean, I could see this very clearly in um, Israeli politics, where um, those who wanted to keep a very rational um, perspective and to be uh, to count on the rationality of the voter to understand his self-interest in the long term, because the rationality is based on the assumption of self-interest. And that if I explain to the voter where his or her self-interest lies, ultimately I'm counting on the voter to recognize his self-interest. And to um, and to and to um, act upon it, but if you have, as I said, if you have a politician that has no uh, shame about using a very powerful emotion as fear, that fear is going to override all the rest because it is the trump card. Um, so it is important to recognize that, and I have no idea what it would mean practically. But if you do recognize that, and if you recognize that it gives a structural disadvantage, at least sometimes in some places, it would give a structural disadvantage to those who um, are in favor or who practice a rational form of politics, then this should change. Um, you know, this could change and should change the tactical um, um, uh, the tactics of those who refuse even that use of emotions of, in politics, because you will be doomed to lose. That, that's my point. And so instead of simply rejecting it, you really have to understand that it is a part of the political uh, process. The s second thing is that um, I think that by denying the inherently emotional dimension of, for example, voting, um, again, I'm speaking about Israel, uh, in which I uh, live. Um, it is interesting, again, that after Netanyahu was elected, some people expressed very strongly the opinion that uh, the Israeli voter is doomed because the Israeli voter does not even know his self-interest, and, and that this was, in fact, this vote was a suicidal kind of vote, and suicidal because it was not rational, precisely around this issue of rationality. Again, I think this is the kind of dichotomy that blocks discussion and that does not understand that people vote for identity issues, for uh, emotional reasons, um, that uh, what some people view as a rational self-interest um, is less important than for some people to reaffirm their membership to a community of meaning and a community of fate, a community of people to whom they feel they belong. That politics is here to stay. 
And so um, instead of bemoaning the fact that people are not rational enough, the question is, you know, how do you reconstruct a democratic model that takes into account the fact that many people, if not most in fact, are extremely emotional uh, and irrational when they vote and uh, respond to symbolic uh, to symbolic politics and that politics really is about uh, it's a, it's an arena of of symbolism of intense symbolism um, yeah now if you ask me if there is uh, globally a move to the politics of fear oh absolutely i think that's probably uh, one of the major changes in the 911 era that is also again this this fear is not only manipulated by the elites and it is interesting that the uh, islamic state i think the islamic state is a, a very smart very smartly understood that fear is really the a uh, heel of Achilles of modern democratic polities because this is exactly what it is eliciting. It is, I don't know about you, but I know that when I watched one of those, uh, one or two of these videos, um, I sensed a very rare, uh, a very rare sense of fear of, uh, although they're very far away, but they managed to create a sense of terror and panic uh, that is extremely effective, and those vi videos are circulated worldwide. Um, and um, the internet makes many of these phenomena immediately global. Um, so I, I would say uh, definitely that um, there is a kind of, we morphed from the Cold War, it's as if the Cold War politics of fear now morphed into a new politics of fear in which uh, the uh, uh, radical Islam or extremist Islam has replaced uh, the USSR of uh, then. Was würden Sie sagen, welche Rolle spielen, äh, spielt das Internet, aber auch soziale Netzwerke? Also man kann ja einerseits, Sie haben auch von den Journalisten gesprochen, von den Medien sprechen, ähm, deren Klasse, klassische aufgeklärte Aufgabe ja eigentlich in der Nähe der, der Soziologen sein müsste, also die Emotionen zu analysieren, wenn man ein idealistisches Bild zeichnen würde. Ähm, wo tragen Medien auch dazu bei, in diesem Prozess, diese, ähm, das, was Sie beschrieben haben, ähm, äh, ähm, diesen Prozess, wo Emotionen die politische Deba Debatte blockieren, voranzutreiben? Also äh, welche Rolle spielen die Medien und aber insbesondere auch Internet in diesem Prozess? I think it's a, I think, well, media and, and network is, I think, different. Um, media um, set the agenda of what is uh, what matters and what matters less. That is a very important uh, stake in politics. In, if you manage, I mean, I think often in election campaigns, the stake is to define what is the most important issue. Is it an employment or is it foreign policy, for example? Um, and according to the capacity, your capacity to push forward one agenda in the media, if you represent one issue instead of another, you're more likely to be elected. So the agenda of a, the issue of agenda setting is very important. The the media uh, are the ones who rate, who hierarchize uh, political priorities. And then I, I think that uh, media also frame issues. They will frame emotions and they will create, they will frame, they will interpret them. They, are, they will provide stories around certain emotions. They will provide some, um, so for example, um, compassion. Think of compassion that has become really a crucial emotion to modern liberal polities. Compassion is uh, mediated, created almost only by the media, by the spectacle of distant suffering, by the fact that we see others that are far away from us uh, and who suffer. If it is a disaster um, or if it is a civil war, media will create 
both the story and the emotion. This is what they do. They, so they not only frame emotions that exist, uh, they interpret, if you see uh, riots in New York City, they will provide you the interpretation for those emotions, but they will also create some narrative frame in which to articulate specific emotions such as compassion. So that's, I think, the role of, of media. It is to, to frame emotions in stories and to define a hierarchy of topics. Networks, I see them as being, again, I'm not a specialist, so I'm you know, making it up, really, now, uh, trying to answer your questions. I haven't researched these topics, but I would say that networks, social networks, are um, very good about the process of contagion of emotions. Emotions are um, socially contagious. They are infectious. They are, circulate. Um, if you are um, angry or scared, for this to become political, you need, as I said with my example of Michel Kolhas, you need to be able to diffuse that emotion and thus to create a, pro a process of diffusion or contag contagion. And I think that social networks are good at two things. One is um, making individual people, uh, so to speak, below the level of the public sphere. Individual people express their emotion and then um, create a process by which this emotion uh, is contagious. So for example, in Israel, um, the protests were um, fueled by a guy who um, protested the price of cottage cheese and who pub published it on his Facebook page and his outrage on the price of a cottage cheese uh, uh, box actually created, in fact, um, um, uh, fire of reactions which uh, then organize, if you want. So what, what it is doing really is to create or to enable, at least in the first stage, a kind of politics without leaders, a politics of self-awareness. The networks uh, break a spiral of silence where people don't speak because they think they are the only ones who suffer from something. But then if you have an, a Facebook page and private citizens express their opinion that resonate with others, then I think it creates a dynamics by which um, uh, um, you, you can have many voices just um, add themselves, resonate with it, mirror it, uh, circulate it, um, etc. So the dynamic of mobilization. Uh, people say that what happened in Tahrir Square um, uh, happened because of Facebook. And that the reason why in the society it did not happen before is because people were afraid. So if you live in a regime in which you are afraid to express dissent, you will not do it, most likely in interpersonal uh, relations. But if you have Facebook and social networks, that process becomes easier. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would say that networks, uh, uh, social networks, enable uh, uh, more easily breaking a spiral of silence and spreading uh, in a contagious way emotional uh, experiences. Sie haben äh, selbst den Vergleich gezogen der Soziologie zu der ärztlichen Tätigkeit. Und an der Stelle äh, hole ich jetzt Aaron Antonowski hervor und sage, ja, es gibt zwei Möglichkeiten zu schauen, defizitär oder auch die Frage zu stellen, was hält uns gesund, wo ist die positive Emotion, auch innerhalb der Politik. Und wäre das dann nicht auch im Hinblick auf Martha Nussbaum praktisch zwei Seiten einer Medaille? Sie sagen negativ die Angst und Nussbaum sagt positiv die Liebe. You know, it's a question I would say of almost taste and personality. I, I, I don't believe in Nussbaum's uh, recipe to encourage the love of, for example, the country. 
um, I don't think those positive emotions um, no, let me put it this way. I think those positive emotions can be thought about or integrated or encouraged once we know what to do with the more difficult or problematic ones. And I think, um, so it could be what you're saying, it could be that you're saying, well, if we gave those unemployed, um, young people um, some positive emotions, maybe they, they would be less negative. But many of them have positive emotions. You know, loyalty to a religious tradition is a positive emotion. Um, um, loyalty to, you know, or wanting your sister to wear the veil is a positive emotion. There is nothing negative about it. Um, so I'm not exactly sure, to tell you the truth, where that th thinking about um, love would take us. I think compassion is a very important emotion because it is what enables us to uh, have interactions with strangers. Love is something that is much more demanding, and and also it's unclear to me. Uh, I think to, uh, I think Nussbaum's argument is very unclear because um, many people who hate also love. So what is it exactly that she wants? She wants them to redirect their love on the right object, uh, which uh, which then seems to me problematic. So a healthy body is maintained also by being aware of what uh, what can threaten it. I mean, it's uh, almost the condition. It's the meaning of uh, preventive medicine. It is to make you aware of what is likely to hurt your body. And um, and if we do that, I think we've done a lot. I think we should be less militant. I think political philosophers in general, sociologists, etc., should be less militant about their own vision of the of the good life. You know, Martha Nussbaum is a philosopher, and it could be that philosophers, in comparison to sociologists, have more um, moral ambition than sociologists. It's probably the case. So I confess I have less moral ambition than um, Ma Martha Nussbaum. <laughs> and I have less moral ambition, so it means I am perfectly happy if I have managed to locate something that is dangerous, something that threatens the health of the body, and understand it, as opposed to condemn it, simply understand it. That is my only ambition. Thank you. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Vielen Dank auch für diesen wunderbaren Vortrag und diese spannenden Thesen.